How are all of you doing today? Oh, come on, we can do a little bit better than that. On behalf of the more than 5,000 uh, engineers and computer scientists as students and the more than 175 uh, faculty here at the University of California, Irvine, I want to welcome you here to our third annual Ingenuity Showcase. This year, uh, as in all the others, uh, this program continues to grow in popularity. It continues to grow in terms of outcomes. And as you will see from many of our students today, it's continuing to grow in impact. And we just thank you all for your taking some time out of your day to come here and to engage and to connect with us. You know, uh, today uh, we have one of the founders and titans of the internet who will address you today. And if you think about our society in which we live today, two items are responsible for the dramatic growth and change in our way of life. You know, it took radio 38 years, 38 years to reach 50 million households. It took Facebook two years <laughs> to do the same thing. And a big part of that was because of the advent of, number one, mobile technologies, uh, but more importantly, because of the advent of the internet. And uh, we have one of the titans and fathers of the internet uh, here today with us, uh, Mr. Uh, Vint Cerf. Please. This event would not have happened, would not have, take not have taken place without the work of some very, very dedicated people. Um, at this time, what I like all of the individuals responsible for the management and the organization of this event to please stand so we can, you can be formally recognized. Thank you. Thank you. Speaking of uh, the organizers, uh, Kristen Hurth, who's, this is her baby, <clears throat> who's looking at me now, giving me the stink eye, saying, you need to go faster. <laughs> uh, so I will. And uh, I want to formally give you an invitation for uh, our keynote speaker, Vince Cerf, who will follow me next. Uh, Vince Cerf is Vice President and Chief Internet Evangelist. Isn't that a cool title? <laughs> I think I'm gonna change my name to Engineering Evangelist. <laughs> Chief Internet Evangelist for Google. He is responsible for identifying new enabling technologies and applications on the internet and other platforms for the company. Widely known as the father of the internet, Vint is the co-designer with Robert Kahn of TCI, TCP IP uh, protocols and basic architecture of the internet. In 1997, President Clinton recognized their work with the US, National, the U.S. National Medal of Technology. In 2005, Vint and Bob uh, received highest civilian honors uh, bestowed in the U.S., the Presidential Medal of Freedom. It recognizes the fact that their work on the software code used to transmit data across the internet has put them at the forefront of a digital revolution that has transformed global commerce, communication, and entertainment. From 1994 through 2005, Vint served as senior vice president at MCI. Prior to that, he was vice president of the Corporation for National Research Initiative, CNRI. <clears throat> and from 1982 to 1986, he served as vice president of MCI. Since 2000, Vint has served as chairman of the board of the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers, ICON, and has been uh, a visiting scientist at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory since 1998. He served as the founding president of the Internet Society from 1992 to 1995, and 
was on ISOC's board until 2000. Vin is a fellow of the IEEE, the AAAS, and uh, the ACM, and also the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Vint has received numerous awards and accommodations in connection with his work on the internet, including uh, the Marconi Fellowship, the Charles Draper, Charles Stark Draper Award, and, an, and his election into the National Academy of, of Engineering. In addition, he's received the Turning Award from the Association of Computer Machinery, the Silver Medal of the International Telecommunications Union, and the IEEE Alexander Graham Bell Medal, and among many other awards. He holds a PhD in computer science from UCLA and more than a, than a dozen honorary degrees. Without any further ado, I bring you Vince Cerf. Well, thank you very much. This is uh, sort of coming back home for me in some respects. I grew up in Van Nuys, California. My parents moved to Orange County around 1960. And as a member of the National Academy of Engineering, I uh, feel free to make use of the Beckman Institute from time to time for meetings and other kinds of academic activities. So I'm glad to be back here, particularly to help celebrate uh, ingenuity and the young students who have shown initiative in that space. So I thought I would spend just a few minutes speculating about uh, what ingenuity means to me. Let me start out by just making an observation that basic science is discovering how things work and why they work that way. Applied science is translating that knowledge into something practical. Engineering, which uh, I consider to be a, a part of, is turning science fiction into reality. And uh, this seems to get more and more astonishing every single day as you speculate about, what if we could do X and somebody says we did that three years ago? Uh, so I'm frankly looking forward to the next couple of decades, hoping I last that long, just to see what more science fiction turns into reality. And finally, ingenuity, which is what we're celebrating today, is inventing non-obvious solutions to hard problems. And it's the non-obvious part that's so important. We don't think of things as being ingenious unless it's something that we couldn't have thought of ourselves. And if you think about the rules for patenting stuff, Patents are granted only to people who have done something which is not obvious to someone who is skilled in the art. And so the students who are receiving awards today have clearly gone through that filter and have invented ideas or invented things that we would not have uh, thought to be obvious at all. I thought I would uh, also draw a few lessons from my experience of 40 years of internet uh, activity. One of them is that, that it was successful in part because of this amazing synergy among different parts of the government, the private sector, academia, uh, and civil society. Um, every one of every branch of the government, except maybe the judicial branch, uh, had something to do with the internet success. The legislative branch, for example, passed laws to fund uh, NSFNet's backbone growth, which linked 3,000 universities together. They also um, allowed for commercial traffic to flow on the government-sponsored internet backbones, which allowed the private sector to discover there was a business in internet service without having to build their own backbone. Of course, eventually several backbones were built by the private sector. Um, there were uh, other things that helped to accelerate the utility of the internet and its spread, one of which is a vibrant stock market and venture capitalists who were willing to make big bets and risky bets. There were also very positive and sometimes negative reinforcement cycles. We went through four iterations of the design of the internet, and uh, the first iteration uh, we documented in 1974 for, with the first paper published on, uh, on internet's design in IEEE Transactions on Communications. And when we tried to implement it in 1975, uh, we discovered we'd made errors and that it didn't work exactly the way we had anticipated that it would, and so we went through several more iterations before it uh, solidified around 1978. But there's also something else that's very powerful and I want to draw to your attention, and that's collaboration, which is fundamental to the Internet's uh, success. Many, many different groups, individuals and organizations across international boundaries work together uh, to help implement this. This is not the work of one or two people. Uh, if, if I could address the engineering uh, people uh, in this audience, one thing you need to learn for major success is to learn how to sell. 
you have to learn how to market your ideas. And so the first thing I notice about the internet success is that I spent an awful lot of my time trying to convince people that they wanted to do what I wanted to do. This is sort of like the Tom Sawyer thing where Tom is painting the fence and he offers an apple core to the other guys and he says, man, this is really fun, you should try that. Well, I, I didn't have an apple core and I didn't have a fence, but the internet was my fence. And a lot of people decided they wanted to spend time and energy to make it happen, spend money and careers making it happen. And so that's a really powerful lesson to learn. If you want to do something big, you have to learn how to sell those ideas to other people. Uh, I, the informality is also very important. When you have formal cooperation, formal collaborations, there are rules about who uh, can participate and who can't. And sometimes the consequence of those rules is to squeeze people out who might have been the most productive participants. So to give you an example uh, of this, uh, the power of this informality, uh, the Conficker worm, which uh, we don't know where it has come from, we don't know whether there are, what evil plans might uh, be associated with it, but we know it's penetrated fairly deeply into the internet. Um, there was a group uh, that was formed, the Conficker Working Group, to try to understand it, understand what its potential hazards might be, and essentially that group was not formalized, and so there were people who were, you know, on the white hat side of hacking, there were formal government groups, there were you know, law enforcement, there were legislators, a collection of different people got together, but it was informal. And the reason that that worked so well is that they didn't have to have any rules about saying, well, can you be a member of this or not? The only question was, can you contribute to it? And so I would say, don't forget, in the course of trying to make things happen, that informality can be your friend. And the other thing I would point out is that uh, in the case of internet, we had collaborations with, in the academic community, clearly sponsored by government, the government funded networking research for more than two decades. If you do the math, ARPA got into this game in the mid-60s and didn't exit the game until 1990. NSF got into this in 1982 and didn't formally exit until 1995, and then they really didn't exit because they had future internet design programs, they had the Gini program, they have a continuing infrastructure program uh, related to networking. And so this persistent funding Willingness to take risk and willingness to persist in support is fundamental to the success of the internet and it's often fundamental to the success of basic research. You cannot schedule breakthroughs. There are some members of Congress who don't fully understand that. They don't understand the difference between research where you're not sure what the outcomes are gonna be and engineering where you're supposed to be able to say, I can do this, it's gonna take this amount of time and you know, it will work. So uh, we need to get that message out that, uh, that, in fact, this persistence in willing to take risk is very fundamental. The last thing I wanted to say about the uh, Internet, and then I'll give you a few concrete examples, is that the reason it's been so successful, in part, is that it wasn't designed to do anything in particular. It was designed to simply move packets from one point to another without knowing why the packets were moving, without necessarily knowing what they were carrying. All it knew was move these bag of bits from here to there with some probability greater than zero, and that's all we asked. <laughs> What's important is that because of that ignorance, the packets don't know how they're being carried. Every time a new communications uh, transmission medium came along, we would sweep it into the internet and let it carry more packets. So we didn't care if it was satellite or optical fiber or a mobile radio channel. Uh, but moreover, because the packets don't know what they're carrying, you don't have to change the network in order to add a new application, you just have to change the software at the edges to interpret the bits that are being sent from one place to another. And that's why as the capacity of the network grew, we were able to do more voice, more video, more real-time interaction, lower latency uh, video games and streaming uh, music and streaming video and the like. So it's important to recognize that over-engineering is sometimes the wrong thing. If you're looking for generality, don't design something for a particular purpose because then you'll be trapped in that purpose, whereas internet has been able to um, essentially support an amazing variety of new applications, partly because it wasn't designed for anything in particular. I would say also about the mobiles that uh, they too have had this amazing capacity to add new functionality. The APIs, the application programming interfaces in the mobile, allow people who are writing the apps to know nothing about exactly how mobile actually works. They don't have to worry about how does LTE work or you know, 3G or 4G or anything else. All they have to know is what's the application programming interface that my app needs to meet to push data in and get data back. 
And this consequence of, of simplicity and hiding of information means that lots and lots of people can build applications even if they don't understand anything about how a mobile works. This again frees the imagination and freedom is uh, at the heart of ingenuity. So here's where we started with the ARPANET with a four node system in 1969. I was at uh, UCLA at the time as a graduate student. I wrote the software to connect the Sigma 7 to the UCLA interface message processor packet switch. Um, and the Sigma 7 is in a, a museum now somewhere, and some people think I should be there too, but uh, <laughs> here I am. Um, yeah, so, you know, I managed to escape that fate. Um, so this is 1969. 25 years later, uh, my colleagues, John Postel, Steve Crocker, and, and I, posed for Newsweek magazine for the August 8, 1994 edition to try to illustrate ARPANET and its, uh, and its background. Now this is exploration of packet switching, which was thought to be a crazy idea in the 1960s. In fact, the then major telephone company of the time, AT&T, refused to have anything to do with it. They said it wouldn't work, but they'd be happy to lease dedicated circuits to allow us to connect our packet switches together to build our stupid network. So uh, we wanted to illustrate how primitive networking was at the time in 1969. So we spent the entire day preparing for this shot. We had the great sheets of paper. We drew all the network connections. And then we strung zucchinis and yellow squash on some wire. And we had these big five pound tins of coffee, which we dumped out. Now, I want you to notice the geek joke in this. If you look carefully at how we did this, there is no possibility of communication because it's ear to ear or mouth to mouth. There's no mouth to ear. <laughs> and we thought at least the engineers who were reading this would get a kick, a kick out of it. So that was our little joke. Well, uh, a few years later, after, you know, ARPANET uh, starts up in 1969, uh, internet gets started in 1973, and by 1977 we're demonstrating a three network system, mobile packet radio network, packet satellite net with, uh, going across the Atlantic, and of course the uh, Ar ARPANET, which by this time had been extended artificially to Europe by an internal satellite hop. So this was a demonstration of three networks using TCP IP. We had a mobile radio van running up and down the Bayshore Freeway in, in the San Francisco area uh, you know, filled, um, with uh, guys from SRI International. Uh, the traffic that was being generated from the mobile van was sent through a gateway to the ARPANET. It was sent, we artificially set up the, uh, the routing, so it would go all the way across the ARPANET through an internal satellite link to Norway, and then down from um, the Norwegian node at the Norwegian Defense Research Establishment to the University College London. And then it hopped out of the ARPANET at that point through another gateway to the packet satellite network over the Atlantic. And it went all the way over the Intelsat 4A, which is a synchronous satellite, uh, to um, ETAM, West Virginia, where it then entered another gateway and went back into the ARPANET and then all the way across the ARPANET to University of Southern California at ISI, Information Sciences Institute. Now, you understand that the uh, packet radio van is in the San Francisco Bay Area. The termination point is at um, uh, USC. That's only about 400 miles. But the packets went about 100,000 miles because they went over two uh, synchronous satellite hops back and forth across the Atlantic, the U.S., twice uh, until they ended up at USC. And amazingly, it worked. And I remember leaping around saying, it works, it works. You know, like it couldn't possibly work. It's software, right? It's a miracle when software works. <laughs> so for me, by this time, I'm at, at the Defense Department running the program. So for me, this was a huge milestone showing that we could get three different kinds of packet switch nets all communicating with each other reliably with, uh, you know, a great deal of heterogeneity underneath but the uniformity being created by the TCP IP protocols. So the internet looks more or less like this today. It's you know, bigger and more colorful, covers a lot of space. What's important about the picture is that each color sort of in, uh, represents a different autonomous system, you could say network. Uh, there are literally hundreds of thousands of networks that made up the internet, make up the internet today. They're all operated independently of each other. The people who run those nets have different business models. Some are not-for-profit, some are academic, some are government. Some are private sector things. Even the little thing in your house is something you spent money on. Maybe you got access from a broadband ISP. You bought a router. Uh, you're using Wi-Fi at home. So all of us are participating in this very colorful diagram. It's not centrally controlled. The decision about who connects to whom is made by the people who run the networks. It's not dictated by anybody. It's not, uh, there's no regulatory uh, imposition on that. 
they choose whatever hardware they want to use, they choose whatever software they want to use, and of course, the only reason it works is that they're all using the same standards. So this is a very powerful example of a grand collaboration. If I had tried to sell this as a business model, I'm sure people would have thrown me out. The reason that we could succeed at this is that we had that long-term government support to try this out and to try to you know, involve more people. Now, as time has gone on, there are more and more things that are part of the internet environment. And I can tell you that uh, I had not anticipated when I was working on this stuff 40 years ago that things like refrigerators or picture frames uh, would be part of the internet. And I used to wonder, you know, what, what would an internet-enabled refrigerator be like? And uh, I thought, well, let's see, in the American families, our communication medium is usually magnets and paper on the front of the you know, refrigerator. So now we can improve that with websites and, you know, blogs and email and so on. Then I thought, gee, if I had an RFID detector inside the refrigerator, and if everything I put inside there had a little RFID chip, then the refrigerator would know what it has inside. So while we're off at work or at school, it's surfing the net looking for recipes it knows it can make with whatever's inside. When you come home, you see you know, recipes that you could have for dinner. You could extrapolate that, which is what engineers should do, extrapolate on you know, whatever you know into what might happen in the future. And so one possibility is that uh, you're at the grocery store and you get uh, an SMS from the refrigerator <laughs> saying, don't, don't forget the marinara sauce. I have everything else I need for spaghetti dinner tonight. So, you know, this is all it looks like a nice future, except that the Japanese have invented an internet-enabled bathroom scale. <laughs> you step on the scale, and it figures out which family member you are based on your weight, and it sends the information to the, you know, to the doctor to be part of your medical record. And that's okay, except for one problem, the refrigerator's on the same network. <laughs> so, you know, it, it, uh, when you get home, you see diet recipes on the display, <laughs> or maybe it just refuses to, to open, you know. It's, 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 it's really, that's really bad. I used to tell jokes that, you know, someday every light bulb will have its own IP address, and I can't tell jokes about that anymore because Philips has made a light bulb called Hue, H-U-E, not H-U-G-H. You can control its, uh, not only its uh, brightness, uh, luminance, but you can also control uh, what color it is from your mobile. Uh, so, and then there's mobiles, which uh, everybody is familiar with. You can see uh, Sergey Brin uh, modeling our first version of Google Glass. We're in the middle of doing a redesign of all that. So Google Glass isn't dead. It's just in the process of going through yet another cycle of serious design. But the reason I put this up here is to draw your attention to an interesting side effect of uh, what Google Glass uh, did, and it's another opportunity for ingenuity. Basically, it's putting the computer into your communication world. Basically, it sees what you see and it hears what you hear. And that I consider to be a very exciting potential because it means that the computer power of the internet might be available to you in the midst of conversations <coughs> and interactions uh, with your colleagues. And so the idea that uh, there might be a sufficient amount of artificial intelligence to correctly interpret what's going on and to contribute to, uh, to what the discussion or respond to questions that you might have for factual information, for instance, uh, I find to be pretty attractive. There's a, a scenario which I am personally um, excited about. Imagine for a moment that we have a blind German speaker and we have a deaf sign language speaker and the two are wearing Google Glass and they want to communicate with each other. So let's see what happens. So the German guy says, Guten Nachmittag, ich heiße Vince Cerf. Good afternoon, my name is Vince Cerf. Of course, the deaf guy doesn't hear that, but the microphone on his Google Glass hears the German transliterates that, in, or translates it into text, then it translates the text into English and displays the English language translation in the little display that you have in the Google Glass, so the deaf guy sees what the blind guy just said. And then, of course, the deaf guy responds by signing. The blind guy can't see the signing, but the video camera on his Google Glass sees the signing, translates it into English, translates the English into German, and then speaks the German in the bone conduction speaker of the Google Glass so the blind guy hears German. Now, the interesting thing is that we can almost do that. Uh, the only part that we can't do very well is recognizing the signing. And I'm talking to people who are very interested in improved image processing, are telling me that this is not out of the question. It's hard, and it may be a while before we can get a computer to be uh, versatile enough to actually follow the kind of rapid signing that uh, accomplished sign language users uh, 
exhibit, but it is not out of the realm of possibility, so it's not science fiction. So someday we may actually be able to do that, and maybe with the new version of Google Glass we will have improved our ability to capture images rapidly enough so that the computer could see the signing, maybe slow it down by, by not watching the video at normal speed uh, in order to correctly interpret what's going on. So I get very excited about that. Of course, you've all watched uh, more and more things coming up on the internet. Uh, and one more interesting, uh, I think, are uh, the devices that you, we might find all around the house, uh, sensor networks, for example. I have an IPv6 sensor network which is running uh, in the house sampling uh, temperature and humidity and light levels in every room in the house every five minutes, sending that data down to a server uh, in a rack in the basement. And at the end of the year, I now have good engineering information about how well the heating, ventilation, and air conditioning has worked. Uh, I know only a geek would do that, but in, in, in the, honestly, I think over time, every building will be constructed this way. And it's important because we'll get feedback and possibly use that feedback for control in order to make better use of our resources to control the use of electricity, heating, and ventilation uh, in order to be more efficient. So uh, one of the rooms in the house is the wine cellar, and that's got a couple thousand bottles of wine in it, so I'm nervous about maintaining the temperature below 60 degrees. Uh, so that one is alarmed, and if the, um, if the temperature goes above 60 degrees, I get an SMS on my mobile that says your wine is warming up. Um, one time I was away for several days and my wife was uh, someplace else and so I, every five minutes I got this note saying your wine is getting warmer. I uh, finally called the guys who made the system. This is not me in the garage with a soldering gun. It was a commercial system called Artrock uh, that was acquired by Cisco Systems. And I said, do you have a remote actuator? And they said yes. So I thought, okay, so when I get the message that the wine is warming up, I should be able to remotely turn on or restart uh, re, uh, the cooling system. And then I said, do you have strong authentication on this system? Because there's a 15-year-old next door, and I don't want him messing around with a wine cellar. <laughs> they said, yes. So we installed that. Then I got to thinking, you know, I can tell that somebody's gone into the wine cellar because I can tell that the lights went off and on, but I don't know what they did in there, you know, when I'm away. So um, I thought, well, why don't I get an RFID tag for each wine bottle? And then if I can do an instantaneous inventory to see if any bottles have left the wine cellar without my permission. So I actually invested in a company that makes a handheld RFID detector, works with your mobile. Uh, you just walt waltz through the wine cellar and it picks up everything. Now you don't have to do spreadsheets and all that other stuff. So um, I was boasting of the design to one of my engineering friends and he said, well, you have a bug. And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, you could go into the wine cellar and drink the wine and leave the bottle there. <laughs> so, so now, now I have to put uh, instrumentation in the cork, right? <laughs> and, and as long as you're going to do that, you, you, know, you might as well sample the esters to find out whether it's, the wine is ready to drink. So before you open the bottle, you interrogate the cork. And if that's the bottle that got up to 80 degrees at some point, that's the bottle you give to somebody who doesn't know the difference. So, <laughs> so I mean, these, the thing I want to emphasize here is the casual way in which we now think about these things. I mean, think about the mobile and its ability to communicate with the internet. It makes the internet more useful because you can get to it from anywhere that you can get to a base station. But the mobile is made more useful by the fact that it can use all the computing power and content of the internet whenever you need it. So these are mutually reinforcing. People are very casual these days about designing products like the ones I have up here that have the ability to communicate to the net because the hardware and the software is literally off the shelf. So this, this enabling character of what's happened with the internet I think is quite powerful. So I wanted to have one last slide here because I'm uh, running over time. Uh, and that's to tell you about the interplanetary extension of the internet. Some of you have already heard about this. Uh, I was just at Goddard Space Flight Laboratory literally uh, two days ago uh, to review uh, some of the advances that they have made recently in this, uh, in this space, no pun, in no pun intended here. Um, first of all, this got started in 1998 at the Jet Propulsion Lab where I've been a uh, visiting scientist uh, for quite some time now. Uh, we had just seen the previous year the landing of the um, Pathfinder robot. 
successfully on Mars. This is the last successful landing was 1976 with the Vikings, right? So there was a big long span where things didn't work. And I remember, you remember the delivery method? It was this big bouncing balloon thing, and it was going boing, boing, boing. I think if somebody had come into my office and said, "We're planning to deliver your two billion dollar rover in a bouncing balloon on Mars," I would have said, "Out of here," you know. But it worked, and that's how we delivered the rovers in 2004. So in 98, we're scratching our heads saying, okay, what should we be doing now that we are gonna need 25 years from now in the space program? And the answer we came up with was building a backbone for the solar system to support manned and robotic space exploration. Now, we were not saying, let's build this giant backbone and hope that somebody comes. That's not the idea. The idea was that if we could outfit every uh, spacecraft which was going off to do some scientific mission with the capability to become a relay in an interplanetary backbone, then eventually we would literally grow the interplanetary backbone based on space missions that had justified their existence because of the scientific value of the mission. So in fact, we've come a long way from those early thoughts in 1998. At this point, we have prototype software running on Mars, on the rovers, on the Mars Science Laboratory, and in two of the orbiters. And they are doing store and forward relay of the data from the surface of Mars. Those devices, the rover devices, are waiting with their data until the satellites come overhead. They squirt the data up at 128 to 256 kilobits a second. And those satellites hang on to the data until they get to the right place to talk to the deep space network, which are the big 70 meter dishes that we have in three places around the Earth. So the data that's all coming back from Mars is doing store and forward. That's what packet switching is all about. We've got the same software running now on the International Space Station. Last year, we had an astronaut controlling a robot in Germany directly using the, the protocols, the interplanetary protocols, so that this is emulating what it would be like if you were an astronaut in orbit around Mars driving something around locally. We can't do that remotely because the you know, radi radio uh, delay time is between three and a half minutes and 20 minutes one way, 40 minutes round trip time. Speaking of which, we started, we started out thinking, let's see, why don't we use TCP to do this? It works on Earth, so it ought to work on Mars. And of course, the answer is, yeah, it probably would, except it doesn't work between the planets. And you know, we thought about this and said, okay, the distance between the planets is literally astronomical, right? And, <laughs> and <laughs> I know, minus two. Uh, and and you know, it's three and a half minutes to 20 minutes one way you know, between Earth and Mars. And TCP flow control is real simple. Basically, you send a note to the other guy saying, I can't take any more data now, shut up. And if it takes 20 minutes for that signal to get to the other guy, and he's sending data full blast at you, and it's falling on the ground, and the packets are flowing away, <laughs> that doesn't work. So, uh, oh, there's this other problem. It's called planetary motion, right? We got the planets are rotating, and we don't know how to stop that. So, <laughs> so, so if you have something on the surface that you're talking to, and the planet rotates, you can't talk to it until it comes back around. Same problem with the orbiters. So we said, all right, we have a variable delay and disruption, disrupted communications environment. We need new protocols to do that. They're called, funnily, uh, delay and disruption tolerant networking protocols. And <clears throat> so that uh, implementation is now in operation, not only on the space station and Mars and Earth, but it's also uh, on a spacecraft called Epoxy, which is in the or sun orbit, and it's visited two uh, comets in the last decade. So the net result, no pun intended, of all this, uh, is that we hope that over time we will literally grow an interplanetary backbone. It's, the protocols are now standardized by the Consultative Committee on Space Data Systems. It's a UN agency made up of all the spacefaring nations. The protocols and their implementation are free of charge for anyone who wants them. It's on SourceForge. You can download it and run it. Some people have put it into Android already, a group in, uh, in Germany. So and there are big opportunities awaiting us, I think given that these things are freely available. And that brings me to the last point, and that is that ingenuity, when freely given, is probably the most powerful force in the universe. When you enable people to use your ideas and to add, <clears throat> to add their own, it's impossible to calculate what the outcomes are. And so I recommend that philosophy to you as strongly as I can, because it's the way we make progress. So congratulations to our winners. Thank you so much for having me here. I'm looking forward to the rest of the evening. Cheers. Thank you.
Let's give Vin another round of applause. <laughs> Thank you, Vin. Thank you for spending time with us today.